club. A box with a square, uh, sorry, square base and an open top must have a volume of 32 cubic centimeters. Find the dimensions of the box that um, minimizes. Oh, wait, actually, find the dimensions of the box that minimize. Okay, this, I assume there would be a typo. It's just the, um, the usual thing. Um, but I think it's right. Find the dimensions of the box that minimize the amount of material used. All right, so a box with a square base. I was like this diagram. That one's so messy. I don't think I could just grab it, copy and paste it. So I'll have to try it again. I already screwed it up. Just gonna draw a square. Kind of. And I'll just do this, copy. Just resize that. All right. So, got a square base. So that's telling us that the dimensions of the length, the, the this length, and this width. Quickly bracket game is out of whack here. There we go. Would have to be the same. Volume is normally length times width times height. So my length and my width would be the same. I can call out whatever I want. I could say let x equal the length and the width because it's a square base, in which case our volume rule would become x squared h. That's one way to handle it. Oh, nice. Uh, Travis, I got you for attendance and appreciate the box compliment. All right. So I'm just trying to clean up my uh, my screen here. All right, there we go. So anyway, <clears throat> we don't know what the height is, right? We do know that it has to have an open top and it's got to have a volume of 32,000 cubic centimeters. Now it's saying find the dimensions of the box, all right? So that, that, that's pretty pretty clear in terms of what it's asking, all right? So 32,000 is what the volume ought to be is equal to x squared h. Now, if we're talking about the material used, well, volume doesn't reference material. The material would be the, the, the structure itself. And the amount of material would reference the area, the surface area. So we want to minimize surface area. All right, so the area of this figure, now I could chuck an H in here. Each one of these facets, again, excluding, just like the previous problem, excluding the open top, each one of those facets would have an area of XH, and it would go all the way around. There'd be four of them. So area would be four times each one of those XHs, or times one of those xh's plus the area of the base, which would be x squared. And 
So that's the same formula we came up with for the previous problem, just using different variables, All right? But the difference here is we have to optimize area rather than optimizing volume, right? So I see here that I have an H and I also have an H here. And if I can swap out the H, divide both sides by X squared, I get 32,000 over X squared. I can make that substitution and get an area formula that's strictly in terms of X. All right, so a little simplifying. Four times the 32, 128, back on the three zeros. X to the first divided by X to the second. Keep the base, subtract the exponents, you get X to the negative first. I'm gonna write it like this because that's power rule ready. I have to say that slow because I, I tend to stumble over it. All right, power rule ready. You know, so um, power rule ready. So find my derivative, negative 128,000, x to the negative second, plus 2x. One thing that we always want to keep in mind is domain, right? We don't have this explicitly stated here, but we want to keep it in mind, right? And, you know, if, if you're worried that you're going to forget to keep it in mind, then explicitly state it. You know, that, that's the thing. That, that, it's one of those kind of weird things that you hear in all the, the in all your classes, just like make sure that you keep track of all these different, you know, ingredients, it, it, you know, it's kind of like, if you have a photographic memory, then by all means, don't take any notes, you know, like in a, in a social studies class of some kind, you know, but most of us don't. So we have to take some notes, right? It's the same idea here. If you think that you're going to forget to account for the domain and start getting into the habit of writing the domain down every time you come up with a function, right? So I'll just do that here and, and very shorthand, you know, it doesn't have to be in any kind of like particular way. You don't have to do an interval notation or anything like that. Just make a little note just to remind yourself, my domain is such that X cannot be equal to zero, All right? Just a little reminder to yourself. And that's because this is really the same as 128,000 over X. Can't have zero in the bottom of the fraction to be a defined function. All right. So just keep that in mind. Take my derivative, set it equal to zero. Take my derivative and set it equal to one over zero. little shrinky dinking about to happen here, as is usually the case. A shrink and a zoom. All right, so I wanna clear out that denominator because this is really the same as saying negative 128,000 over X squared. If I multiply each part of this fraction by X squared, each part of this equation, I should say, by x squared. I get a negative 128,000 plus 2x cubed. For the other one, I mean, I don't know if there's any real value in doing that because if I put this over a one and cross multiply, it would seem like everything crosses out. But if I do it this way, and then get a common denominator. You see the numerator kind of gives you the same ingredients, 
but then that denominator is still an X squared. Right, so there, there's a solution lurking in here, but what's going to end up happening is that solution is going to be irrelevant because we took uh, took into account the the uh, domain. Right, so one over zero would be negative one hundred twenty eight thousand plus two x cubed over x squared. Cross multiply, get x squared equals zero, which means x is equal to zero, which is irrelevant. And that's because our function doesn't exist when x is equal to zero. So all that for nothing. But unless you know that that's how it's gonna play out, it's something that you have to try. All right, the other one, we could actually do something. All right, so I'm gonna add 128,000 to both sides. I'm going to divide both sides by two. I'm going to get x cubed is equal to 64,000. And we take the cube root. Now, if you don't recognize that 64,000 is perfect, then you can just pop it into Desmos, you know, 64,000 raised to the one third. You get a 40 that way, but I kind of look at it in the different parts. It's really 64 times 1,000. 64 is a perfect cube, cube root is four. 1,000 is a perfect cube, the cube root is 10. Put it together, four times 10 is 40. And so either way, you should get x is equal to 40. Right. So I have a critical value. Now that critical value should in theory represent a minimum or a dimension associated with a minimum surface area. But we need to confirm that that's actually the case. Right. So that's where the sign chart comes into play. So I had a, um, a min-max question in my pre-calc unit test last night. And, you know, in theory, don't know derivatives yet. And so um, a student answered the question. It was a trig function that asked for a, um, a minimum value, minimum and maximum. So what did he do? He took the derivative of the trig function, a composite trig function, which is really fun. Took the derivative, set it equal to zero and solve for X. And I'm like, okay. I mean, that's a good first step. I mean, wrong course. So my first uh, suspicion is, all right, you didn't tell the, the person online that you got this answer from that it's a pre-calc class, not a calculus class, but you know, aside from that, all, all he did was he found X equals and then said that that was the minimum or the maximum, whatever it was. And it never verified that that was, in fact, the X value corresponding with the minimum. Now, as it turns out, you know, it could be, I mean, I suppose it could be like a trick question. I mean, it wouldn't be like that on one of my tests or anything. But, you know, like if you're only going to get one critical value, and the question's asking for a minimum or a maximum, and there's only one critical value in existence, it, it's a, it, it, it better be associated with a minimum or maximum depending on the problem, all right? But you need some kind of justification and the justification that I'm asking you to give is um, that of a sign chart, all right? And, and you'll see when, when you take the test, the directions for a question like this will say, be sure to include a sign chart to justify your answer. Right, so X, now in terms of domains for this uh, volume situation, X represents a length of a side. We would expect that length to be bigger than zero.
And we would expect it to probably not get too, too big. All right. So, because we're talking about 32,000 as the cube, the cube's volume, or of, well, cubes, who says it's a cube? Uh, the uh, three dimensional solids volume. Right. So if you pick a reasonable high value, that, that'd be fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't pick 32,000. I'll tell you that. But if you do like the cube root of that number, that's probably not a bad idea. You know, maybe something, maybe something, oh, I, a cube root might be a little small, but you know, like that, that kind of gives you a sense of scale. So zero to 40, maybe 40 to 80, maybe 40 to a hundred, you know, something along those lines but something reasonably high, all right? So I'll, I'll, go, I'll go 40 to 80, all right? We just need a reasonably large value on the opposite side of that critical value. So F prime, um, A prime, sorry. And then our conclusion. Now, this is where you can get kind of, um, I'll call it efficient. And the reason I say that is because, you know, like I've been showing you how to actually plug in values with Desmos and all that stuff. But if you're looking at your derivative function, so that would be, get a good highlight going on here. It would be this bad boy right here. You pop in X values here, you could kind of, figure it out pretty quickly. But if you go even back a, a step prior to that, to the original function that led to that derivative, and I'm not gonna leave the highlight here because it looks terrible, but this function, right? So that original function, what the sign chart is telling us is where that function is increasing, decreasing. So just take a look at that graph around your critical value. Okay. Uh, actually, I might be back at the beginning. Okay, so I'm going to write it. I'll actually use a simplified form of it. 128,000. Those are not zeros. Zero, zero. X raised to the negative first power plus X squared. X squared. I don't know why I had to do there. All right. So 128,000 X to the negative first plus x squared, all right. I don't see no graph, so let me zoom out. Looks like I'm getting some graph here. Now it's kind of crazy where it's ending up, but we've got to kind of expect that, I mean, with 128,000 as part of the, part of the, um, the equation, that it's not, it's not going to be too pretty, you know? So, um, you can go to a table, have a look at some of the points. You know, they're pretty large, you know, starting at zero, zero, zero undefined. because That's where there's an asymptote. We don't care about negative. We're looking at like 128,000 and then it decreases from there, right? So I need to go up as high as, let me undo this, as high as 128,000. I'll go even higher, maybe 150,000. I don't think I need to go down to negative 2000, whatever. But in terms of the X values, I mean, I only care about up to like 80. So I, I got this up to like 1400. So let me go zero to 80 and then take a look at the picture. All right. So at 40, it looks, or prior to 40 anyway, it looks like it's decreasing. So that would correspond with the negative sign. After 40, it looks like it's increasing. That would correspond with a positive sign. So it's kind of like we're fudging the numbers here a little bit by taking the graph and saying, all right, well, instead of evaluating the numbers to figure out if it's decreasing or increasing, why don't we figure out if it's decreasing or increasing and use that to determine the signs, all right? So relative minimum. And so, you know, it, it's sort of like against the spirit of what you're supposed to be doing here, but you know, it's also a matter of just trying to get the job done too, right? So there's that, or you can do F prime, you know, put your original function in, 
f prime, pick a number between zero and 40, like 20, for example, gives you, excuse me, gives you a negative. And pick a number between 40 and 80, gives you a positive. Either way is going to be fine. All right. The benefit of doing it by numbers is if you, if you couldn't, you know, you're like right back here and you're like, I can't find the graph. And then you zoom out and you're like, what the heck is going on with this thing? You spend more time trying to figure out how to, how to come up with the domain and range of the graph that's appropriate. And before you know it, you know, like you've, you've burned like 10, 15 minutes trying to make, make this problem a solution, all right? So going by numbers might get the job done a little quicker. So anyway, that X value is the length and the width. So now we just need the height. So H of 40, that should be what, one half? 100, oh wait, uh, 120, no, no, 64, no, I'm squaring it. So it's gonna be 1600, yeah. So it's not even, not even close to what I just said. For some reason I had 128,000 in my mind and even that wouldn't have given me one half. So my brain wasn't working right. There we go, 20. All right, so the height should be 20. And so my dimensions would be uh, 40 by 40 by 20, all centimeters. All right, so when it comes to these optimization problems, you see I'm using a very specific approach. I can tell you, and, and this, isn't, this isn't really a threat as much as it is a, um, a pledge. If I see any kind of approaches being used to solve problems related to optimization on the test, that's not related to this technique, there will be massive point deductions. But I know a better way. Well, that's not, a, that's not relevant at this point, right? So I, I need you to do it this way, right? And, you know, like to address the, the unspoken thing in the room, like the day after I give a test in my pre-cal class, it's, you know, Things like cheating are foremost on my mind. And so, uh, you know, I, I still think about, I think back to situations where, you know, somebody submits work on a test with four different types of handwriting on it, right? Uh, and, you know, techniques that are so different from what we're covering in class that it could only have come from the internet. Right? Notation that, that I've seen, I've seen it somewhere. I know exactly where I saw it. Khan Academy, yeah. So it's like, well, what are you, what are you doing? You know, like I, I, you're, you're going to use the techniques that I'm showing in class, and and that's that's how you're going to demonstrate that you've been doing what I've been asking you to do, All right? Um, also, it's something that I've noticed that certain certain handwritings I've become very uh, very adept at recognizing. So it's kind of interesting because the, uh, the the folks at the tutorial center on campus, they have a very distinct writing style. And so when somebody, and, and then again, I'm, I'm like barking at you all for the sins of another class, but it is what it is. Maybe, it, maybe it'll be like a nice forewarning. Um, Yeah, and so what, what people are doing is they're, they're going to like net tutor and stuff like that and, and having some tutor do their work for them, right? But the thing is, when, when there's a, enough questions on an assessment, you don't really have the time to transcribe everything. So, 
but what these folks have been doing is uh, submitting the handwriting of other people. And when I go to the tutor and I say, hey, is this your handwriting? They say, yeah, yeah, where'd you get that? And it was submitted on a test for this student. Oh, okay. So, uh, so just, just be forewarned. All right, there was another problem that I wanted to go over. Number 10, like I said, I would, I would only go over the, uh, the relevant problems. Cause I, I, like I, like I said, like I said, um, I put a little too much into this packet in terms of the word problems. It, it kind of went a little crazy. I was like, oh, this is another word problem for optimization. There's some things that are just a little, little overboard. Right. But, but number 10 is a nice problem. Right. I'll give you a, nice, a little visual on it. So you have f of x, they say y, I say f of x. Hey, we're, we're used to that by now. Go back to standard zoom. It's saying what point on that graph is closest to the point two zero. So two zero is that point right there. Now there's some point on the graph and I'll, I'll plot it. Uh, actually, let me plot the point first. Some point on the graph a comma f of a. All right. Some point on the graph that's closest to that point two zero. Now it's probably somewhere in this neighborhood. You know, is it the one at zero zero? Is that the closest point? We know that that's two units away. Is there some point maybe in this neighborhood over here that's even closer? You know, who knows? Now, it's kind of um, kind of an interesting concept because if we're looking at a sideways parabola, which is what you know a radical function really is, or at least part of one, if that point happens to be the focus. Then, then there's there's a nice tangible relationship, but it, it's not guaranteed to be the focus. Yeah. So, so if you're looking at that as kind of like a, a like a little sneaky shortcut, then I'd probably not not get too fond of that idea. All right. So two zero. That's one point, and then a comma f of a. That's another point. Make a little line connecting the two. If the uh, little highlight jammy works. There we go. And so this is what we're what we're up against. That line segment, the distance associated with that line segment, is what we're going after. So clearly, not some point over here. It's getting longer and longer. It's got to be something in this neighborhood. Maybe maybe it's right here. Maybe it's right here. Well, right here has got to be closer than it, it, it's definitely closer than this point. This point is two units away, definitely. This one you could tell just by looking is less than two point two units away. Right. So this one already beats this one. It's just a question of it, if that's truly the winner or if there's something else that's even better. All right. So what we'll do is find or write a, an equation that represents the distance between these two points, all right? Let me just do a quick rough sketch of it. All right, so there's a point here and a point here. This point is definitely two zero. This point is completely unknown, any point, in space can be defined as x comma y, which in turn can be defined as, in this case, because we're saying y follows the pattern or path, x comma, we could then change the y to a radical x, all right? So what we wanna do is write a model that finds the distance between x, comma radical x and two comma zero or vice versa, it doesn't matter. All 
minutes. So distance formula. D is equal to X2 minus X1 squared plus Y2 minus Y1 squared under a radical. But what I can do is square both sides to make it D squared is equal to just this stuff. Okay. Now I can call f of x d squared. I could let it be equal to the radical expression too, but if we minimized the squared distance, that would necessarily also minimize the, the distance itself. Right? Because the relationship between squared distances are, are, are the same. Right? If a squared distance between two points is smaller than the squared distance between two other points, then the actual distances would hold that same relationship. Right? The reason why this is a good thing to do is because it gets rid of the radical and it allows us to still optimize the distance formula without having to worry about nasty chain rule along the way. I mean, we're still gonna have some chain rule, but nothing, nothing too crazy. Right. So I would say f of x is equal to, well, it doesn't matter what order you do it in, x minus two, difference between the x values, difference between the y values, So we'd have x minus two as a quantity squared plus, this one's really nice because that's a radical x squared, which is just x. So then what I can do is, I, I mean, I, just to avoid doing chain rule at all, I can distribute, it's just, just binomial squared, distribute that out, x squared minus four x plus four. And so my function or the function that would represent the distance, the square distance between two points would be x squared minus three x plus four. So then taking the derivative of that, uh, and by the way, before I forget, the domain, you know, this one we wouldn't have to write because there's no restriction. The domain is going to be negative infinity to infinity. We have no excluded values along the way. And so I can jump into my into my derivative, 2x minus 3. Then I can set my derivative equal to 0. There's no point in setting it equal to 1 over 0. When I do that, I'd add 3 to both sides, divide by 2. And I get x equals three over two. All right. So the x value that minimizes the squared distance between two points would be three halves. All right. So I'll actually I'll write that whole statement out. So the x value that well we don't know that it minimizes. So I'll make the sign chart in a second, but we'll say optimizes. the squared distance between two points is three halves. So the X value that optimizes just the distance between the two points would also be two halves, uh, three halves. All right. You know, it's it's kind of like 
it, it, just a very simple example. I tell you that I live a hundred miles away from work. And then you say that you live 25 miles away from work. Right. So that's, that's fine. Right. It's pretty obvious. You live closer. Your distance is shorter than my distance. Right. Now, if we square both of our values, yours is 625 minus 10,000. But the relationship is still the same in the sense that the smaller number is still smaller when it's squared. All right. So the, the reverse would be true. If I say that my squared distance from work is 10,000, 10,000 square miles. All right. And your squared distance from work is 625 square miles. Then you'd say, okay, your square distance is smaller than my square distance. The consequence of that would be that your distance is smaller than my distance. Right? So that's what's happening here. So then just a quick sign chart, just to verify that this is actually gonna be a minimum rather than a maximum. We, we have no reason to think that three halves, so which is 1.5, would be a maximum. This looks like it, it certainly looks like it could be the smallest value or the smallest distance, but we want we want some kind of guarantee. So we would have x f prime and then our conclusion. All right. This this function, this radical function. Now our distance formula, our squared distance formula didn't have any restrictions to its domain, but the the original function certainly does. This only exists on the domain where x is greater than or equal to zero, right? So no need for negatives here, right? So my x values, which tie together with the original function, could never be less than or equal to zero, or no, less than zero. So zero to three halves, three halves. And then really it could be one of those Theoretical situation. So, I mean, this function could go on forever, but you know, obviously, as you look at the, the diagram, it is getting larger and larger, the distance between the two points, but it could technically go on to infinity. So, and this is one of those situations where you could get away with just putting in infinity. Right? So then testing the value is pretty simple. All you have to do is pop them into the derivative if you want to do it numerically. If you don't want to do it numerically, then you, know, you can just kind of fudge it. And by fudge it, in this case, you don't even have to look at the graph because you're looking at a parabola with a leading coefficient that's positive, which means it's a parabola that opens upwards, right? So this must be referencing the vertex of that parabola. So it's decreasing followed by increasing. So minus followed by plus, decreasing, increasing relative min. Right. And so which point on the graph, the point on the graph, that would imply a coordinate, x value, three halves, y value, y is the square root of x, the radical three halves. No need to rationalize or anything. Right. So that, that's pretty, you know, funky, but it's also pretty cool, I think. So you can see, you know, it does it does appear to be getting, I mean, if you really bring it in over here, it does feel like the line is getting smaller and smaller until you hit this point right here, at which point it starts getting longer and longer again. Right. But it's kind of, it's one of those things where maybe, maybe it only feels like that because we know the answer now. Beforehand, it might've been like, well, I think it's one. You know, it starts getting longer after that, shorter up until one, you know, maybe, you know, and that's a reasonable estimate, you know, and later on, we're going to talk about estimates and why they're important and how we could use estimation uh, in conjunction with calculus. So 
that's a lot of good stuff coming up. All right. So that's it for Professor, I had a quick question. Sure. Um, how did you know to use the distance formula, like out of all the formulas? Well, because we're talking about the shortest, or I'm sorry, closest to the point. Mm -hmm. Being close is, is the measure of distance. Okay. 